right now, just in case you would have lost this weekend after Valentine's Day for something to do, something to watch, fret not my pets, we've got the main man himself, Van Connor, Mr. Movies of a Friday with one, two, three, tip top TV film recommendations. So big screen action on your small screen. And let's welcome him back. Good morning, Van, and how the devil are you, sir? Good morning to you, Mr. Ross, and a pleasure as always. Now, it's one of those weeks where we, or weekends rather, we've both chosen the same film for the Saturday. We'll get to that in a moment, but let's start with your recommendation for today. It's a bit of a beast, this movie, isn't it? <laughs> it's a literal beast, and of course, uh, interesting one, one to be on telly, because the latest version of Jane Austen's Emma opens in cinemas uh, today, so it's nice that we get to pick. That movie's Mr. Knightley in what's arguably his breakout role, so this is uh, Beast, written and directed by Michael Pierce, starring Johnny Flynn, who we'll see in the next couple of years playing David Bowie in the long, long gestating biopic, and opposite Jesse Buckley. This is about a young woman who lives in sort of isolation. I think it's meant to be like the Isle of Man or somewhere yeah. like that. The Jersey sort of or British, somewhere, I think, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Channel Island. Yeah, somewhere, somewhere like that. Yeah, Channel. Isolated woman with a haunted past who meets a sort of roguish, you know, bad boy type. There's something to him. Is he, uh, is he on the level? Is he not? Is she on the level? Is she not? There's a lot of intrigue between them. The question is, which one of them, to quote the title, is the beast? I've got a clip for you. When I was 13, I stopped to go. What? I was bullied at school, and this one day in class, this girl came at me, and I, I can't really remember what happened, but one minute I'm holding some scissors, and the next is sticking out of her. What happened? I was expelled. Mum quit her job and schooled me at home. Tried to beat the bad out of me. You're a good person, Mo. You don't know me. I know that people make mistakes. If you keep carrying that around with you, you won't be able to stand up straight. Now, I really enjoyed this in a slightly don't-look-now way, because it's quite an insidious <laughs> film. It kind of gets in your head, doesn't it? And it's it's just a suspense field, but also there's a constant sense of foreboding and things being slightly off-kilter. That's it, isn't it? Like you say, there's a lot that don't-look-now, too. And there's, it's very much about dread, and it's very much about atmosphere, and it is about the tension between the two. Like you say, it's one of those films that you watch with a sort of horror movie sensibility, yeah. because you know that something isn't quite right here. And because of the fact that there's so many shades of grey to both of them. You're never quite sure just where the darkness is going to emerge from. And I, I think it's a genuinely brilliant film, but I think they are both terrific in it. Can you remind us uh, when and where we can see that? Then what channel is it on? Uh, so you'll be able to find this on Film 4 at 9 o'clock tonight. OK, well, a little later than that, in fact, technically, my Friday recommendation edges into Saturday, because after the uh, All Elite Wrestling on ITV4, at 12.40am yeah. tonight, so just after midnight, we have got, from 1987, a Stone Cold, Stone Killer classic from uh, Stanley Kubrick. It stars Matthew Modine, Adam Baldwin's in it as well, Vincent D'Onofrio, and also in his first film, it wasn't his last, former gunnery sergeant, a man who served in <laughs> Vietnam himself, R. Lee Emery. Drop and give me 20, boy. Pain is nothing but weakness, leaving your body. It's about the training rituals and routines for young uh, recruits, draft, uh, draftees going into Vietnam, and I'm not going to play, I mean, you, you know this movie. It made a lot of money, I think, for the studio. It cost 30 million. A lot of it was filmed in London's Docklands, because Kubrick did want to fly, so uh, Vietnam was replaced by the kind of them being rebuilt Docklands. It made over $120 million. This is a real Vietnam classic, isn't it? It really is. I said, there's so much to say on this film, but you know, I want to take it away. I want to hear what you've got for us, Mr. Ross. Well, what I've got is something rather different. Not a trailer, not a clip, but the fact that the drill sergeant, uh, a lot of his dialogue was ad-libbed and stuff he'd used in years of training. As I say, he saw service in Vietnam, 14 months there, uh, would be very reluctant to talk about wh what happened there in interviews afterwards and some genius in the record business sampled some of his lines um, from the film. This song, Full Metal Jacket, hit number two in the charts. It's called I Want to Be Your Drill Sergeant. I want to be your drill instructor, not your drill sergeant. Number two in the charts. Have you heard that before, ever? I had not heard that. That is <laughs> insane. It's fantastic. It's worth seeking out. I've got it on vinyl somewhere. I've never seen it on DVD whether, or CD. Whether, but there was some kind of licensing issue afterwards. I do not know. But there he is. So not only is he one of the great Kubrick films, he's also a almost a chart topper, Ali Emery. And let's go now to Saturday, so that's again 12.40 tonight into 
this Saturday morning on ITV4, right after all Elite Wrestling. And tomorrow we've both gone for an offering on Dave, film from 2004, 9 o'clock tonight on Dave. You tell us what it is. We, we did this without consultation. Both went for this one. A really underrated film, this in my opinion. Oh, very much so. And I actually think that this started the small subgenre of its own. I, I call this the start of what I, uh, what I refer to as the Taken genre, where you take an older actor who's known for dramas and you put him into a hyper-violent R-rated action film. And that is, of course, 2004's Tony Scott director Denzel Washington-led Man on Fire. I mean, it is a great film. This For those who haven't seen it, it's basically, he is a kind of washed-up, highly trained soldier. He's got a kind of drink problem. He's, because Mexico City is so prone to kidnapping, his job is to look mm. after a little girl, basically. He gets very close, very fond of, and then of course, predictably, you might think, but very movingly, the nine-year-old is, is kidnapped in Mexico, and he goes on a kind of... I mean, there were very stark and quite disturbing elements. He goes on almost a kind of vengeance trail to try and find her because sometimes, you know, the money's taken and the people who've been kidnapped end up being killed. What have you got for us? It's a great cast as well. Christopher Walken, Mickey Rourke, as well as Denzel Washington. And I think it was written by Brian Helgeland, who also wrote L.A. Confidential and Mystic River. So he's, you know, as adaptation. He's got a real pedigree to this. What have you got for us, Van, on the clip front? So I've got a clip for you of uh, Denzel setting out on his bloodthirsty quest with all the, uh, all the best emotional intent in the world, naturally. My own baby. She needed me so much. And sometimes I felt like I had nothing to give her. Just, uh, I don't know what to do. What are you going to do? What I do best. I'm going to kill him. Anyone I was involved, anybody who profited from it, anybody who opens their eyes at me. I mean, it is a great journey film, this is. Now, what I loved about this, it does that thing that Hollywood, it's now almost a cliche, but it stays, you know, they do the kind of, the, the telly type thing on the screen. Text comes up and it goes, Mexico City. And then it goes, Saturday. And then it goes, 11.47 a.m., as if the minutes make a difference to it. But it gives it a kind of reality. And this is a very real film, isn't it? It very much is. One of the things I quite liked about this, because obviously this is a film that I think pretty much revitalised the later years of Tony Scott yeah. as a director. I mean, I'd grown up with Tony Scott from films like Days of Thunder and, of course, Top Gun, things like that. But then when you got to this, this started a lot more of a kinetic, uh, energetic, hyper-edited era for yeah. Tony Scott that would basically define in his later years. Tony Scott's obviously sadly no longer with us. But, you know, you feel the legacy of this film in things like, you know, for instance, the later, the, the, more, the more recent years, the last decade, really, of Liam Neeson's career. Yeah. I mean, I must say, I hadn't, I, I hadn't made the connection with Taken, but you're right, it's exactly that thing that somebody who's kind of out of the game, almost in their sunset years, mm. and they're, they're drawn back in like Michael Corleone. Exactly that. But the thing about this as well, like you point out, is, is that, that supporting cast of people like Christopher Walken yeah. and Mickey Rourke. And it's just a belter of a time. It's bleached out. It's it's got that that sepia and orange tint, tint to it. It's got the hyper violence. It's probably the darkest thing Denzel had ever done at that point. Absolutely. But at the same time, an amazing performance. And owes a debt to to, to the western naturally yeah. as well. So elements not terribly it, surprising. Without giving too much elements of it, at times reminded me of Shane towards the end. And when you watch the film, you'll find out why, folks. It's an absolutely fierce, full on movie. It's nine o'clock tomorrow night on Dave from two thousand and four. It's Man on Fire. And on Sunday, I've picked a goodie for the afternoon. Where would we be, Van Connor, without a Western <laughs> recommendation from Paul Ross? And that's me. I'm going for 2.30 on Channel 5. It's also shown, I think, starts at 3.30 on Channel 5 Plus 1 from 1990. Unbelievably, this is Gulp. 30 years old now, based on a great book called The Holy Road by a man called Michael Blake. It is, of course, uh, Kevin Costner, the film that won him Best Director, it got Best Picture, Best Score, an amazing film, Best Cinematography, Best Adapted Screenplay. It is the majestic Dances with Wolves, and we've got the trailer for you. Just hear that you've been decorated. And they sent you here to be posted? Actually, sir, I'm here at my own request. Why? I've always wanted to see the frontier. Do you want to see the frontier? Yes, sir. Before it's gone. There ain't nothing here, Lieutenant. Everybody's run off or got killed. What about Indians? 
So for those who haven't seen it, I urge you to catch it. It's 2.30 Sunday afternoon on Channel 5. Basically, he's a hugely brave, but uh, suffering with PTSD, Union soldier veteran from the Civil War. He goes out west, of course, and he's appalled by what he finds to do with the treatment of the Indians. And a lot of this film is, is spoken in Lakota, the language, but with subtitles. And at the time, that was very unusual, wasn't it? I mean, it's happened more now with films like The Passion of the Christ and other films, but this is a real breakthrough film, I think, for Costner. Oh, absolutely. And he's absolutely terrific in it. And I do remember this being that sort of watershed moment where Costner solidified himself as being equally at home behind the camera as he was in front of it. And of course, nowadays, we, we sort of jokingly think of I think of this film as regards Avatar, because, you know, the two films kind of overlap in a lot of ways, including the language barrier, including yeah. the, the plot and things like that. But, uh, you know, this this film now, like you say, it's 30 years old. It's astonishing that it's that old. But we, we forget that this kind of did revitalise the Western as a sort of mainstream vehicle. And in fact, I was lucky enough to, not for this film, I've interviewed Kevin Costner once, and I kind of, you can imagine I was a bit of a Johnny fanboy with him because he's made White Earp and Open Range with this, of course. And he said he had to really struggle and kick and scream and even put up some of his own money because the budget for this... He only got 22 million for it, and then suddenly Hollywood woke up because it made almost 450 million dollars. And it's one of those things. Oh, but, absolutely! But every penny is on the screen because it is beautiful to look at. This film is that's why it won best cinematography. It's epic on a vast scale. I think what a great film. And of course, it wouldn't be the weekend without a Paul Ross Western. And a Van Connor rom com with a very comic twist. <laughs> and, and this is a this is a controversial selection of yours because I know you've been asked in the past, what do you think is the best remake of all time? And your answer sometimes surprises people, doesn't it, Van Connor? It doesn't do so. My choice for the best remake of all time is the Steve Martin led nineteen ninety one remake of the nineteen fifty Spencer Tracy comedy, Father of the Bride. And I'll defend that on I'll defend that till my dying day. Have you got a clip for us? I've got a clip for you of course this is the story of uh, george banks played by steve martin and you know very simple premise his daughter comes home from you know holiday college college time overseas she's met a man she's getting married here's a clip what? i'm engaged <laughs> i'm engaged i'm getting married <laughs> congratulations <laughs> thank you oh my my oh so oh my and that's your engagement ring, huh? Yes, yes. We got it at a flea market outside of Rome. The guy we bought it from said it was at least 100 years old. Wow. So, Dad, stop it. Say something. I'm sorry. What did you say? Dad, I met a man in Rome, and he's wonderful and brilliant, and we're getting married. It is very sweet, this, and it's around this time he also made Parenthood, which is another good old comedy film, isn't it? The interesting thing about this as well is if you sit and watch this on Sunday afternoon, uh, you get the pleasure straight afterwards as well of watching the sequel, because they're putting them on back to back. <laughs> there was a sequel? I've never caught that. Blimey, Charlie. Oh, oh, the sequel was all about childbirth, but the gimmick for the sequel was that, as well as the daughter... Oh, that's right, pregnant, the mother... I know, I have becoming, seen it. The yeah. mother's pregnant as well, that's right. So it's kind of, yeah, father of the bride, and then father of the bride part two, Grandpa. when he becomes a dad again. <laughs> Oh, Van, you've done us proud as ever. Thank you very much, Elise. Some great recommendations. There's Beast and there's Full Metal Jacket on today. Man on Fire's our B. We both went for that one tomorrow. And you've got then Dances with Wolves and Father of the Bride for Sunday. Van, can we do it all again next week? Sounds like a plan to me, Mr. Ross. There was a hesitation there. Are you absolutely sure? Please say yes. Positive, don't you worry. Okay, let's end with another burst of Full Metal Jacket number two in the charts. It's I Want to Be Your Drill Instructor. Get my... <laughs>